Hello, everyone. I'm Alan Potcotter, and you're listening to Call Talk for August 5th, 2020. Today's topic is pivoting from the office to remote, making it work. If you're listening live, we invite you to be part of the show and ask questions. Here's how you do it. Email me at calltalk at benchmarkportal.com. I want to remind everyone that all of our shows are archived and available to listen to at benchmarkportal.com any time of the day. And now with that, I would like to introduce the host of the show, Bruce Belfiore. Thank you, Alan, and welcome back to Call Talk, everyone. Well, for many companies, shifting to remote call centers due to COVID-19 wasn't as simple as just flipping a switch. And that's why we wanted to bring our Call Talk audience some more good information about the shift to remote contact centers. And we brought in an expert on the topic for you, Fabrice Martin, CPO at Clarabridge. And Fabrice has a really interesting background. Uh, he has a French father, Mexican mother. He grew up in uh, Mexico. And so his mother tongue is Spanish. His father tongue is French. He brings a multicultural view to the things that he does. So Fabrice, bienvenue, bienvenido to the show. Merci beaucoup. Muchas gracias. And a pleasure to be with you guys. Okay, very good, very good. But let me just ask you, Fabrice, what language do you dream in? Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've been living in, in the U.S. for more than 20 years, so I, I really think I dream in English, believe it or not. Very good. No, no, I, I believe that. Uh, when I lived in Italy, I dreamt in Italian, so that's, uh, that doesn't surprise me. Okay, well, yeah, good. Yeah. well, we're really happy to have you on the show, Fabrice, and uh, Fabrice is uh, responsible for the vision, roadmap, and go-to-market strategy for the Clarabridge CX suite of products, and uh, he brings more than two decades of experience uh, launching new products and business applications uh, focused on solving large, complex analytical problems and delivering valuable insights for managers like the uh, folks who are on this show. So, Fabrice, a question on the mind of many managers who have had to transition quickly because of COVID-19. Uh, for companies who decide to remain remote past COVID-19, what are some of the things they need to consider in regards to the contact center? Uh, in other words, can contact centers remain remote long-term without negatively impacting the customer experience? Uh, that's a great question, Bruce. And, and um, I think that there there are many things to to consider uh, to your first question, right? Uh, the the second question will will address as we go. But but I think the first thing to consider is that uh, the the definition of a contact center tends to be broad, right? A lot of folks think about uh, calls. It was even called uh, the call center, but it the, it has evolved to be a contact center because there's many ways that customers nowadays uh, have dialogues and conversations with, uh, with companies, right? And uh, uh, more and more we're seeing a, a big rise in digital channels, right, that go beyond calls. And, of course, there's the digital voice over IP way to have calls, but there's also chats, there's messaging, uh, there's uh, social media direct messaging. All of those channels are becoming more and more important when it comes to, again, interactions and conversations between customers and companies, and they are more and more being handled by the contact center as well. So uh, uh, when it comes to, to really thinking of a more permanent uh, remote contact center, it is important to have very strong digital channel capabilities, and again, I mean chats and emails and social media and messaging, and a very strong backbone uh, to support them. And by that, I mean the ability to offer a, a continuous, ideally a seamless experience to customers uh, that might be hopping from one of those channels to another, but the, the companies who are setting up these contact centers need to make sure that that hop is, is seamless, right? And if they're chatting with the company and then they move to SMS or they move to call, uh, the, the company is, is able to make that switch and, and continue the experience uh, very seamlessly. So those are very important aspects. Uh, now to, to the second part, right? Remaining remote without negatively impacting customer experience. 
Um, there are many aspects to that, but but one of the aspects that uh, uh, I think is often overlooked, but but it is very important, is that uh, employees are very important, right? Uh, uh, it's it's an adage or, or a known uh, thing, a known fact that happy employees tend to make happy customers, right? So making sure that those remote contact center employees, those agents that are working from home or from remote locations are happy, are engaged. Uh, so, uh, that is very important to, to that continuity and, and great customer experience. So listening to the voice of the employee, making sure that you have a, a good pulse of, of where the different uh, agents and contact center staff are is, is going to be essential to uh, maintaining that, uh, again, positive, engaging customer experience. Um, yeah, so I think those are all great points, uh, Fabrice. And there's, um, you know, the, the, the fact is that uh, today's contact center is so much more multi-channel than in the past. And, uh, you know, I think in terms of uh, TTM, which is that you have to have the right technology to make it work, you have to have the right training so that people know how to make the technology work well. And uh, you also have to have uh, the motivation. The M is the motivation so that it all works out together. So, um, yeah, that's a really, really important and all the more important when you have a uh, an organization that is thinking of remaining remote over a, a long period of time or perhaps uh, forever. And um, then we'll also get into, you know, things like screening and, and hiring, uh, another thing that uh, uh, is very important. Well, with so many agents confined to their homes due to COVID-19, uh, how can companies avoid disruptions to their center operations and, and their customer experience? Could you just give us a little bit more of your thoughts and insights on that, Fabrice? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, Bruce. And, and there's a a few aspects to this, so I would break it into into a few parts, right? And and the first one is uh, avoiding disruptions, uh, as you mentioned, right? And and we have seen uh, uh, you're hearing an ambulance pass. That is part of working from home. <laughs> uh, so I'm gonna let it go through. Um, you can see that this is life uh, just uh, happening in 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 real time. So uh, first thing is to avoid disruptions. We're seeing a big move of uh, contact center infrastructure to cloud-based systems, right? Uh, cloud-based systems have the uh, ubiquity and, and presence uh, that really change the game and, and basically enable anyone with a good internet connection to be a, an active, productive, contributing employee, right? Whether it's the contact center or any other aspect of, of a modern corporation. So that move of all critical systems, including contact center, backbone, and operational systems to the cloud is, is, uh, is an important ingredient to, to uh, mm -hmm. avoiding disruptions to the contact center. Uh, and then, assuming that everything is there and everything is operational, I think when it comes to customer experience, it is very important to have strong uh, measurement frameworks uh, for the operations and for customer experience and strong quality assurance, quality management methods, right? Uh, because uh, uh, it's not only important to make sure that, for example, contact center agents are saying the right things or solving customers' problems, but one ingredient I would add, because we're talking about customer experience, is really tracking things such as, for example, customer effort or customer emotions. And uh, I'm a big fan of a, a framework uh, I didn't invent it. It's, it's a framework that uh, the first time I heard of it, it comes from uh, Forrester Research, and they talk about the three E's of customer experience. It's uh, effectiveness, ease and emotion. And uh, I really like that framework when it comes to customer experience because if you think about effectiveness, that's what most people think about, you know, quality control, et cetera. Effectiveness is making sure that the customer is getting value by offering the right product or service, right? So most programs tend to track this and they track it very well. Uh, but then the second E, ease, 
is really making it easy for the customer to do business with the company, right? And the easier the experience, the more long-term loyalty you will have from customers, right? And we've all experienced this. If a company makes it very hard to do business with them, whether it's to buy their product, find it, find the price, return it, that tends to have an impact on loyalty, right? So important to track it. And then the third E, which is emotion, which is you gave the customer the right value. You made it easy for that customer to do business with you. But even better, what if you make that customer feel really good about doing business with you, right? So tracking that emotion will have a big, big impact on long-term loyalty and overall customer experience. So I like when I see those three being monitored and measured consistently. Right. No, those are great points. I love the three E's, too, that you mentioned. And, um, you know, when you think about uh, those elements, uh, effectiveness, ease, and emotion, uh, all of them, we need to have measures of them. How do you actually measure effectiveness? How do you measure ease? How do you measure the emotion? And so that becomes really, really interesting uh, as a conversation. And you can imagine, Fabrice, a benchmark portal where we deal with metrics all the time and how do you uh, measure things and what are the best practices that you can then use to try to move the dial, that there's some really, really interesting conversations that uh, come up uh, on this. And, uh, you know, there are effectiveness measures that you can have, which include, uh, you know, things like uh, the overall, not for the individual uh, agent, but for the center overall, what's your average speed of answer? Uh, how many times do you have to put people on hold? What's the... Uh, uh, percentage of dropped calls or abandoned calls, all of those things which are have to do with the quality or the effectiveness and many more. And then the Absolutely. ease, which, uh, you know, in, in terms of how easy is it, uh, you know, those are the kinds of things you definitely have to ask the customer about. Uh, the uh, uh, And that's a customer effort score type of thing. I imagine uh, you'd see that there. Is that correct, Fabrice? That's right. That's right. There, there's a, there's a, a method to this, the customer effort score, and, and, and the beauty of effort is that it can be, uh, it can be uh, uh, calculated based on a survey, which would be the traditional way to do customer effort score, but you can also infer it from mm -hmm. data, right? So from the fact that customers might be having to hop channels multiple times, uh, that is effort, right? The fact that a customer calls three, four times for the same thing and have to explain again why they're calling, mm -hmm. again, that's effort, right? Uh, even yes. the, the, the things that the customers say and tell the agent, whether it's on a chat or on a call, again, will have a reflection of the effort, right? If, if the customer says in the call, oh, man, this is the third time I'm calling and, and you still haven't been able to solve my issue, again, that's an expression of effort. So there's many yes. ways to infer it, but very important to track it, as you just said, Bruce. Yeah, yeah, no, very important. And then the emotion part actually tends to flow from the first two E's because if the uh, effectiveness is really good and the ease is good, then the emotion tends to be good as well. And uh, that's the emotion is where you're building loyalty as well. That's sort of the... Uh, sense that you're doing business with the right people, you like uh, the business that you're doing with them, and you're validating your choice of doing business with the company. So it's actually a, sort of a patting yourself on the back as well when uh, you have that emotion of, wow, that was a good interaction. I'm really glad I, I'm dealing with uh, XYZ insurance company or something like that. So uh, those are all great things, uh, knowing how to measure them, how to improve them, uh, you know, I think we could have another calls talk episode just on that, Fabrice, sometime in the future. So, uh, I, I would really love good that. stuff. Okay, love very to go good. Near and dear to to me. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, just continuing on with our, our original uh, area of inquiry here, with with the challenges of dropped calls and audio issues. Okay, that came with many contact centers that are uh, had to push people out to their homes, et cetera. Uh, on other digital channels such as social media, chatbots, and more, uh, what type of insights can companies gather from leveraging these additional channels? Absolutely. 
so there's there's a, a, a few things to consider here, right? And, and I would say if we take a, a step back, if it's about insights, um, most companies today want to build uh, really an integrated and holistic view of, of customer experience, right? They, they, um, they don't want to, to have siloed views of the customer, like the, the interaction on the website and the interaction on calls or the interaction on the mobile application, right? They, they want to see the customer uh, uh, journey, if I'm introducing a term here, as a continuum, and, and that's how customers see their experiences with companies, right? So we're all trying to build that unified, integrated, holistic view of the customer. And the types of insights that can be obtained from looking at these channels can be important because uh, if we go back to the example uh, that I gave you uh, a few minutes ago, right? If, if I'm calling and I say, this is the third time I'm calling and, and you still haven't been able to solve my problem, uh, that conversation and tapping, understanding that conversation might give you a lot of insights about other aspects of the journey. Maybe that customer is calling because they're trying to find an answer to a change in their policy, right? This is happening a lot during uh, COVID-19. Uh, policies are changing. Customers are trying to look for um, uh, moratoriums or those types of things, and that information might be really hard to find on a mobile app or on the website, and therefore they need to call. So there might be a lot of interesting hints and insights about other operational aspects of the business that are going to come from that phone call, right? So maybe they discover that the issue is on the website, and if they fix the issue on the website, they're going to eliminate all of those calls that are coming to the contact center. So high value if you're able to extract those insights from, from uh, contact center conversations. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, those are great insights. Uh, and, uh, actually, you know what I'd like to do is to move to some questions that I think Alan has. Um, Alan, do you have a question, a couple questions there for Fabrice? Yes. The first one is from Marie, and she's asking, I have five supervisors reporting to me who are struggling with doing their work remotely. Any ideas for them? Uh, that's a there great question. <laughs> Don't we all feel the same these days? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a very, very practical, down-to-earth question from Marie, so that's uh, great. Absolutely. So um, I would say this, right, with, with the current process and situation, uh, I think it's easy to get lost, get a little bit disoriented, right? You Every day feels the same. You wake up, you go to the computer, you check your email, you start a phone call or a Zoom session, et cetera, and, and then Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they all feel the same, right? So, so uh, uh, that struggle, again, is the, the one that I think we, we all feel. But what I would say is that it's important to stay grounded, uh, as an employee, as a manager, and make sure that uh, you and your employees are, are grounded, connected to the core mission, uh, to the company culture. And, and the way I do that with my team is that I talk to my team uh, as a group and also on a one-on-one -on -one basis at least once a week. Right? At least once a week, I take the pulse of everybody and keep everybody informed in terms of what is going on with their lives, with my life, with the company, with the business, where we are as a team, what we are collectively aiming for and working on. So keeping everybody well-informed, grounded, and connected to the mission, I think, is, is motivating. And, and I have seen it work really well in terms of, of, uh, uh, of folks that would otherwise be struggling. Mm -hmm. Well, I think those are great uh, pieces of advice and insights there, Fabrice and Marie. I might add a couple of things too, and that is that, you know, we're we're all going through this together. You've heard that before, but it it really is true. And so, one of the things that I think managers need to do is just to be open about that with their uh, the people who report to them. Uh, don't try to be a superhero who has all the answers immediately, but uh, do have something that's really important, which is empathy. Now, think about it. Uh, the supervisors and the trainers are all trying to get the agents to show empathy, right? I don't think there's enough emphasis put on 
uh, call center managers to show empathy. So you as a manager, Marie, need to show empathy for your supervisors and through the kind of contact that Fabrice was just talking about, uh, find out from them you know, what it is that's disturbing them, what their challenges are, et cetera, and they will feel more connected to you as a result. In fact, uh, there are situations where people end up feeling more connected in a remote setting when they open up to each other and show that empathy than they did back in the call center because, you know, that was kind of business as usual. Uh, so as long as you use the uh, opportunity to really show the empathy to your supervisors and then coach them in how to show empathy for their uh, agents, who should then be showing empathy for their callers, many of whom are having challenges and impacts depending on the industry that you're in uh, because of COVID as well, then that uh, chain of empathy can be extremely important, I think, to help you to do a better job in terms of managing those uh, supervisors. So, uh, you know, we see a real increase in interest in coaching uh, training right now. And it's understandable because coaching has become extremely important in terms of holding things together and, uh, you know, sort of cementing or knitting relationships that are going to be extremely important. So um, anyway, yeah, thank you for that question. Anything else you wanted to add to that, uh, Fabrice? Otherwise, we can go on to the next question. Uh, I mean, nothing other than I completely agree, right? That that empathetic approach uh, goes a long way in creating that connection and grounding to, to the mission. Yes, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Marie, for that question. Alan? Yes, the next one we have is from Chris, and he is asking, recruiting and hiring remotely feels weird. What are best practices in this area? Great question, Chris. Uh, so I cannot claim to be an expert in hiring, but I have had a, a few experiences uh, during this pandemic and before, so so I can I can at least offer uh, what I have seen work. And uh, Bruce, I'm sure you you'll uh, you'll complement that too. Uh, so first thing is that I think you need to make sure you have a good understanding of the type of person you are looking for uh, when you're going to be doing some hiring, right? And of course, it's going to be over the phone. It might be over Zoom. But you want to understand not only the professional credentials that you're looking for, but also uh, the fit in the organization. Do you want a person who uh, is very talkative? Do you want a person who is more uh, introverted? Do you want a person who is uh, self-motivated? Uh, do you want a person who loves being part of a team, right? You have to make those considerations part of the process of, of uh, defining the profile of the person that you want to go. And once you start the interview process, you're going to have uh, different people uh, interviewing this uh, potential candidate, make sure that you assign tasks to each interviewer, right? Uh, one person is going to be assigned to uh, uh, probing for, again, you know, uh, 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 emotions or or is this person introverted or extrovert? Another might be scanning for, uh, again, professional credentials, et cetera. But you want to make sure that each interviewer, beyond trying to connect to that individual, also is, is looking for one of those specific criteria that you define in your profile. And ideally, after you finish that process, you will have uh, a few candidates that are really good matches based on this process. So uh -huh. I've seen that work with, with my hiring, and, uh, and, and they have resulted in, in uh, good team members and, and, again, good contributors to the culture. Yeah, okay, great, great inputs there. And, um, yeah, I, I would uh, just add to that that uh, also see if there are some uh, tools that you can find that help you uh, uh, to find the kinds of people that you need in terms of, uh, you know, f using technology for that. Uh, there's some really good uh, products out there now that help with screening for technical skills. Uh, you want to make sure somebody can keyboard properly. I mean, I was at, I was at a, a center not that long ago, and uh, everybody was a, a university student. And at first, the, uh, this was in another country, 
um, the uh, people, the, the uh, HR people sort of assumed that everyone could type well. Well, they can type well if it's their cell phone, right, their, uh, their, their <laughs> smartphone. But in terms of actually doing typing the way you do on a normal keyboard, that's a different matter. And so some of the people were really having problems and challenges, and they didn't know this about those uh, folks before they hired them because they didn't screen for it. So there are good ways of uh, using technology to do that kind of screening. There's also a technology that helps you screen for language skills, uh, and competency, and uh, so those are some things that you may think about doing too. Take a little bit of the load off and increase your possibility for success by uh, offloading part of it, the front end part of it, on technology to sort of screen out the folks that you really do want to talk to. And uh, one of the things that I'd, I'd add to what Fabrice was saying is that uh, one of the early interviews is really just to make sure that the person has a proper phone presence uh, because there's some people who look really good on paper but then um, are untrainably difficult in terms of their communication style. So communication style is extremely important there too. So um, those are things I think that um, you, know, you can also use to help out uh, to make sure that you overcome the awkwardness of the times and uh, and have success in terms of hiring the right people who will be able to deliver the kind of quality service and uh, that uh, Fabrice is talking about. Fabrice, did, would you like to add anything to that? No, absolutely. One thing I would add is, is as you said, right, uh, There's um, you also want to consider the channels. We talked about chat. We talked about SMS as potential channels. Uh, showing empathy and, and being good at understanding intent uh, in those channels it can also be challenging. So, so that should be part of, of the considerations when you're hiring and looking for, for uh, folks who will be on the other side responding to customers in those channels. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, now uh, there's more automation that's going on too, and people are experimenting more and more with chatbots that uh, have these mm -hmm. characteristics that we've been talking about. And so there's some very exciting uh, things that are going on there. I think it's uh, overwhelming for many managers to think about some of that stuff. So you have to kind of um, uh, take the uh, AI, the uh, artificial intelligence part in, uh, in bytes and have to, as a manager, learn about it. Uh, before you jump in, because there's many people who've jumped in and perhaps gone too fast, too too far, too fast, and it hasn't worked out well. But those who've done it well are rewarded extremely uh, handsomely for that in terms of savings and in terms of quality. So, um, well, good. I think we're we're pretty much at the end of our time now. But uh, Fabrice, are there any final thoughts that you'd like to share with our audience uh, about the topics we've been talking about? Uh, well, first of all, thank you, Bruce, for uh, this great podcast. It's uh, it's a fantastic opportunity, and uh, I appreciate you sharing the space with me and with Clarabridge. Uh, my parting thought would be to really make sure that uh, uh, our, our listeners uh, pay attention to that framework, the three E's of customer experience, right? Uh, making sure that you focus, track, and measure effectiveness, ease, and emotion will have a massive impact in terms of the customer loyalty that you generate to your contact center and the level of customer experience that you generate. So uh, focus on those, and uh, we'll see you around the corner. Excellent. Okay, that's great. And I, the tracking one is also one that, you know, we could spend an entire uh, episode on because that's so important too. Uh, many of the things that we talked about, uh, including the one on uh, hiring and using tools for screening people, uh, those things should not just be done, they should also be tracked to see if they actually work, because in some cases they'll work better than in others, and you want to obviously uh, hone your best practices, uh, you know, practices so that you actually get the most out of it. So thank you so much, Fabrice. Uh, great episode, and with that, I'll turn things over to Alan to wrap things up. Yes, thanks again to Fabrice and to Bruce for your insightful discussion on today's show. We hope you can join us next month for another great show or look at our huge selection 
of archive shows and hot topics at benchmarkportal.com. Then click on Call Talk, where you'll find over 11 seasons. From all of us at Benchmark Portal, keep those headsets steady and your fingers ready. Stay safe and stay healthy. This is Alan Pockhutter signing out. Have a great day.